Hi, welcome. Glad you could come today. I am so into what I'm going to teach you today, and I hope that uh, you are as well. If we all like stories, and who doesn't? And the Bible stories are always, to me, the most exciting, uh, the most interesting. And I wanted to go back to the story of the beginning, not, not the big creation story, because we all know that. But I wanted to go back to the beginning of Abraham and his people. Now, as you well know, I'm sure, that the Bible has all these wonderful stories in it, and there, there's a lot of mystery to them. And these stories tell us about the characters, but we have a lot of blank stations, blank spaces in there where we think, well, what, what preceded this, or what happened from here to here, this kind of thing. So I have some little stories I want to tell you about what happened to Abraham and his family. Now, I'm sure that you know from Scripture that they started out in Ur of the Chaldees, which is today's Iraq. It's over by the Euphrates River. It's like way east. And they were, um, the people who lived there were worshipped Sun God and they worshipped Nimrod. Nimrod was the king at that time. So whoever was king was God, as well as the Sun God. And so Terah, Abraham's father, made idols. Now, you know, I sometimes I think we don't comprehend this idol thing. They don't just pop up out of the ground. Someone has to make them. And so Terah's father was a businessman. He made the idols. He had an idol shop. You could go into his shop and you could buy the different the different idols. You could figure out which one you wanted, the little tiny ones, the great big ones that you wear around your neck. Whatever you wanted, you could go to, to, to Terah's idol shop on Main Street or wherever and buy the idol. So. We have Abraham, who is younger at the time, not a child. Oftentimes he's portrayed as a child when this happened, but he wasn't. He was a little older. I'm not exactly sure, and nowhere is it written that I'm aware of how old he actually was. However, he was old enough to be a shepherd. So he was out in the shepherd fields doing his thing with the sheep, studying the stars at night, and he began to understand that there was one true God, and his name was not Nimrod, and it was not these idols that his father had in the shop. But what was he going to do about that to get people to understand that there was one true God? And so he took this on as his mission. So one day, his father, the shopkeeper, had to go away on business, and he left Abram, who was not yet Abraham, Abram, in charge of the uh, shop. So when he comes back, there was a great disaster in the shop, huge. All the idols had been broken, just smashed to smithereens, all but one. There was this tall guy standing over here in the corner, tall idol, and he had this rod in his hand. And so when Tara, Abram's father, came back, he looked over there and he said, What happened here, Abram? What did you do? And Abram said, I didn't do it. He did it. And his father said, He can't do it. He's just a piece of clay. And Abram says, Therein is my point. Okay, so what happens then? Word gets out real quickly to Nimrod. In fact, some of the stories say that Abram, uh, Terah actually went to Nimrod and told him what happened because he was frightened. Now, you'd have to be really frightened to go to the king and tell them something bad that your child had done, no matter the age of your child. So he went to the king and he confessed. And so the king said to Terah, Nimrod said to Terah, bring him here. He must die. And so when Terah brought Abram before Nimrod for, for the encounter and and Nimrod was going to have him killed. Tara argues the point. And he says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. He said, let's, let's have a contest here. Let's see who is the one true God. And so Tara, uh, Nimrod built this huge bonfire, huge. And he said, okay, this is what we're going to do. If your God is real, then he'll rescue you because I'm going to throw you in that fire. And this is kind of like a familiar story we've heard in Daniel, isn't it? However, this is Abram's story. And so the bonfire is huge, and they throw Abram into it, and he comes out of it totally unscathed, does not even smell. No fire things. And so his brother, Haran, is there. And so now they're looking towards Haran, and they're saying, okay, kid, brother, 
He said, uh, who's your God? And he had said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm with him. I'm, if, he, if he came out of the fire, I decided if he came out of the fire, good, then I'm, I'm going to be with him. His God's going to be my God. But if he didn't come out of the fire, good, then Nimrod is my God. And so they pick him up, throw him into the fire, and he perishes. Now, you would think that's the end of the story. Everybody lives happily ever after. However, that wasn't the end of the story because you see now they are a threat to the whole Chaldean society. I mean, these are idol worshipers, and these guys just blew the whole idol scene, blew to smithereens. And so they have to get out of Dodge, and they have to go quickly. Now, you could decide, did they go by night? Did they have, were they kicked out or what? But anyhow, Terah leaves, and he takes his family with him. And so if we wanted to look at Genesis 11, uh, and start over here, uh, lost my place, in verse 26, uh, actually in 24 it says, And Nahor lived 29 years and became the father of Terah. And Nahor lived 119 years after he became the father of Terah. And he had other sons and daughters. And Terah lived 70 years and became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Now these are the records of the generations of Terah. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot. And Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his birth in Ur the Chaldeans doesn't say he died in the bonfire, but hey, that's the story. And Abram and Nahor took wives for themselves. The name of Abram's wife was Sari, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and Iscah. Iscah is also a Hebrew name for Sari. And Sari was barren, and she had no child. And Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarah, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went together from Ur of the Chaldees. And they went to a place in the north of Turkey today called Haran. Now, Haran is dead. Now, where this, how this place got the name of Haran, we really don't know. But we're going to make the assumption that it was because they went there and they named him for the brother or the son who is now deceased because he didn't come out of the fire. He was the hot dog. So anyhow, what we have here now is the story of starting over. Abram is, uh, Abram is 70 years old. His father is older than that. They're starting over in a foreign land. And they stay there for a time. A short time, actually, but, but it's time, 10 years, I believe. And then they leave. God calls uh, Abram out again. And he says, now, I want you to come with me. I want you to come with me to the land I'm going to show you. And, and so they leave. This is the second calling out of Abram. They leave and they start south. Now, guys, there was no GPS. There was no map. They didn't have any idea where they were going. They were God-pointed south was what they were doing. And so they left Haran and they started south with Abram, Sari, and Lot and their company of people. Now, their company of people was a new number of slaves or servants, if you will, plus a lot of animals. And they started south to the land that God was going to show Abraham, Abram at this point. And Torah actually reads in, in Genesis 12, 1, Torah reads, Go for yourself from your land, from your birthplace, from your father's house to the land I will show you for yourself, for your benefit. This is about taking care of you, Abram, because your relationship with me, the Father, God the Father, is good. And I want I want to use you because you are brave enough to stand up to Nimrod. I want to use you to start this new people that will soon be called the Hebrews. And so we see then in Genesis 12, 3, where God says to his says to Abraham, we're going to go, we're going to, um, we're going to go south, and I'll show you where I'm taking you. And when I go there, you will be, everything will be good. So Abraham was actually 12, uh, 75 when he departed from Haran. And he, his father was 205 when he died, having lived 60 years after Abram left. Now, there's this misconception that Terah had already passed away when Abram left, but he hadn't. He lived another 60 years. So he had his life going, and he's there. He's building a community in Haran, but 
Abram and Lot and Sarah and their their community head south. So Genesis 12, 1, 3 is a scripture that my husband and I have stood on for years. We totally believe this. For the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house, the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. You, Abram, a great nation. He's leaving dad behind, and he's going forth in the calling of God to become a great nation. And God goes on to say, and I will bless you and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. Pretty simple. But for some reason, we oftentimes forget this scripture. We forget that God is making a promise to Abraham that goes down through the generations and even affects us today as as Christian believers, this, this curse, this blessing affects us as well. Because when we come into the kingdom, we come into the, to the faith of Abraham, we come into uh, the Jewish root of our faith. You know, we have a Jewish God, a Jewish Bible, a Jewish Savior, a Jewish land. What else do we want? We have really come into this Jewishness, but oftentimes we forget about that because we forget what our heritage is. And our heritage is right here, coming into this land. So, we go on then, and Abram goes forth, and they're traveling, and all their possessions, and all the persons, and everything they have. And God takes him to a place called the Oak of Morah. Now, this is up on a mountaintop. Today, it's very near a community called, um, I can't think of it, uh, anyhow, community in Israel. And there's the Oak of Mori there, and it's what we call the Three Sea Outlook. And on a clear day, you can see the Galilee, the Mediterranean, and the Dead Sea. So we call it the Three Sea Outlook. And God took Abram there, and he said, this is your land. For as far as you can see, this is your land. So Abram went there, and he, he realized that this wasn't just something that was just happening. This was something that God is doing, and His promises to Abram, and this is His His forever, forever and ever, and His and His um, genealogy as well, His children to come. And so Abram goes there, and he he settles in to this land. Now we know the story as we go forth. We hear the story of Lot. Now, Lot is the son of Haran, and the one who died, Abram's brother that died in the fire, Lot is his son. But obviously, there was an affinity between the two because Abram brought him out with him, not only from Ur of the Chaldees, but also from Haran. He brought him with him, and he took him south with him. How old he was, we don't know. But we know that he took Sarah, his niece, and Lot, his nephew, with him and they headed south. Okay, so when they get there, and God makes this promise to him at the Oak of Morah, other things happen. He pitched Sarah's tent before he pitched his own, which shows us a man should provide his wife with the proper housing. Now, I know some guys don't want to do that. They don't want to, um, they don't want to take care of putting their wife up first, but this is just common courtesy. Gentlemen, now, you might wonder, well, why he pitched her tent? I mean, if they're married, why aren't they living together? Because this wasn't necessarily the custom of the day. They had her tent, they had his tent, Lot had his quarters. And then, as we'll read later on, we'll see that Abram welcomes guests to his tent. Now, if this is the woman's tent, you couldn't bring in male guests. But when you have Abram's tent, it's wide open, and he's there sitting in an opening of his tent, welcoming guests in. And so this is, this is the reason that you have multiple tents. Also the fact that probably some of the women stayed with Sarah, some of her handmaidens stayed with her, and helped her take care of the encampment. Now I'm telling you, they're not blow drying her hair, and they're not putting on makeup. They're taking care of the encampment. You know, they're, they're getting down to, to working hard and living well and following God. Now, what we see here is they're there, they're not there very long before they run into famine. Why did God bring them into this land, the land of milk and honey? 
And then, then um, soon thereafter, I mean, very soon thereafter, there's famine in the land. And so what happens then? They go south. And if we look at, um, if we look at, at Genesis 12, 10, it says there was a famine in the land. So Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. Now, sometimes we have to have a famine in our own life to have have the ability to hear God. Now, I think Abram was hearing God just fine, but he still had to have this famine for a reason. Something was going on. And so he goes down to Egypt. Now, he says to Sarah, who is gorgeous, she's just beautiful, and he says to Sarah, okay, let's make this deal. When we get to Egypt, because you are beautiful, when we get to Egypt, let's say to Pharaoh that you are my sister, okay? Because I'm afraid that if I say to Pharaoh that you're my wife, because of your beauty, he'll have me killed. And then you'll have to go live with Pharaoh. And really, Sarah, wouldn't you rather live with me? You know me already. And so that was the deal that they struck. And so they went to Pharaoh and, and she, um, Pharaoh came, he took her. And then when he realizes something is, is significant here, he sees, uh, he sees that she's beautiful and he realizes that there is a relationship between her and Abram that is not brother and sisterly, but husband and wifely. He begins, and there's this, there's a plague. God struck Abram's family with uh, Pharaoh's family with a plague. We don't know what that plague was, but we have a sense that it might have been some kind of um, a sexual dysfunction, something like that. And so Pharaoh begins to figure out this didn't happen until I took her. What's going on? And so actually, we'll see where God actually speaks to him and says it's because of Abram's wife. And so to make amends for that, we see um, we see Pharaoh give a lot of things to Abram, a lot of animals, a lot of um, a lot of different things. And so I've written this book. It's called Genesis Triangle because it's about the beginning, about this time frame, about the children, the grandchildren actually of Abram. It's about Rachel, Leah, and Jacob. And I think you would like to have this, this book. It's called Genesis Triangle, written by me. How about that? Um, it's on Amazon or you can get it through me. Okay, so what we see here now is when, when they come out of Egypt, now they are exceedingly wealthy exceedingly they have a lot of animals they have a lot of servants they have a lot of everything including uh, wealth they also have Hagar with them so that creates a little bit of an issue later on but we'll talk about that in another teaching so what we have here is Abram coming out of of Egypt with his family and they go back to this land that God has given them the land called Canaan now, it's full of Canaanites at the time, and the Canaanites certainly are not godly people. And we might wonder why God chose this piece of land to give it to Abram, but it's because it's his land. And he knew he could trust Abram to take care of it and, and to help it become a good land. And so we see them going back to Canaan, and then it's not, uh, not any time before this strife. And the strife between Lot Lot's uh, shepherds and Abram's shepherds. And the strife is simple. It's because they have so many animals now. And if you've ever been to Israel, you know that the Negev, I mean, you have to go through the Negev to come up, to come up from uh, Egypt. And the Negev is basically just a desert. And it, it's not good grazing land. And so this is strife. And it's going on between the shepherds of, of Abram and Lot. And so... Lot's shepherds were wicked, and they would say, This land has been given to Abram, and he has no heir, so Lot will inherit this estate, therefore it's not theft. And the Canaanites and the Perizzites were dwelling in the land, so Abram had not yet come into possession of it. Okay, they're like guests in the land right now. So this fight is going on between the shepherds, and finally uh, Abram says to Lot, Okay, you choose. You choose. Where do you want to live? There's not enough grazing space here for both of us. So you need to choose where you want to live. If you want to go east, I'll go west. 
If you want to go north, whatever you choose, and then I'll go in the opposite direction. So Lot wasn't exactly a dumb guy. At least, we don't think he was. And so he stands around and he looks over here towards the Jordan Valley. The land is green. There's a river that runs through it. A river with clean water, even though it runs into the Dead Sea. But it's a, it's a river, and so there's, there's grazing, and there's green, and it looks like plenty. So he chooses to go to the east, to the Jordan River, towards Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's where he goes. He takes, he goes there and he takes his shepherds and he takes these animals and he is going to live in the city of Sodom. And there he takes a wife, has some daughters, etc. So we see Abram going on. He goes to the west and to the north. And he goes to Beersheba. And there he builds his future there. And so everything seems like it's pretty good for a while. And then there's a war. And the war is the war of the kings. And we, we see this in chapter 14 of Genesis. And there's five kings that come against Bera, the king of Sodom, and Bersha, the king of Gomorrah, and Shinab, king of Adma, Sh Shemember, king of Zeboam, and, and the king of Bela, that is Zor. And they're going to have a war. You know, it's, it's not like there's a United Nations or a NATO or anything like that. They're just going to have a war. We don't know why they're going to have a war. They're just going to have a war. And so they go and they attack Sodom and Gomorrah. And they take along with them Lot and his wife and his children. Now we know this was not a real quick thing because when, when Lot went to Sodom, he didn't have a wife. He didn't have kids. He had shepherds and he had animals. So he got a wife there. And so then they had children. And so then, you know, we have a few years going on here, 15 years, 20 years, I don't know how long it was, but a few years there before this war happens. And so by now, a lot is living the easy life in Sodom. You know, it's a, it's a city, it's a corrupt city, it's a bad, bad city. And he's living the easy life there because he's just choosing not to look at what's going on if I hide from it, you know, if I just hide my head, I don't know. And I can walk around with blinders on and I can't see what's going on. And he didn't have CNN and he didn't have Fox and he didn't have the crazy media telling him what's going on. So he's just walking along being kind of, and what happens? Abraham is really, really stressed out by the fact that these visitors come to tell him that, he's, that they're going to go destroy Sodom because it's so corrupt. But before that happens, I got ahead of myself there a little bit. Before that happens, there's the war. And the war is when they are, um, when they flee and, and Abram has to go rescue Lot. Chances are that if Lot had not been involved in this kidnapping situation, Abram might not have gotten involved. But when it's his family involved, he has to go rescue them. He has to go play a part in making them whole again. So he takes his men and he goes north to, um, goes way north and he, they rescue, it's almost, almost to Lebanon. And they get these guys and they bring them back. And so what happens then? Lot goes back to Sodom. He likes it there. And um, it's at this time that uh, Abram meets Melchizedek, the king of Salem. Now we want to read this carefully because there's Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought up bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God the Most High, and he blessed him, and he blessed, and he blessed him, and said, "Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand." And he, Abram gave him, Melchizedek, a tenth of all. Okay, this is the first time we see what comes to be known as the tithe. But the next verse, I want us to look at very carefully, because I think if we don't, we can kind of get confused. Because in verse 21, it says, And the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give the people to me, and take the goods for yourself. 
And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread or a sandal thong or anything that is yours. Least you should say, I made Abram rich. I will take nothing except what the young men have eaten, and the share of the men who went with me, Aner, Eshkel, and Mamre, let them take their share. Now, when the king of Sodom, remember, we're talking about Sodom and Gomorrah here, and when he left uh, Sodom to go to this battle, he falls into a tar pit, so he doesn't even go to the battle. I mean, he has to go home and get cleaned up. Somebody should have thrown some feathers and tarred and feathered the guy. But he, that didn't happen, and so he had to go back to Sodom and get cleaned up, and so he ended up not even going to war because by then, after all, they'd already gotten so far, he couldn't catch up with them, or so you could think. So now he comes and he meets Abram along the way, and he says, okay, give all these people back to me. And when he says people, it translates soul. Give these souls to me. Give them back to me, and you take the wealth. And Abram said, no, I don't want anything from you because my God, my God, the one true God is my provider and not you. And I don't want it ever to be said that you, the king of Sodom, made me wealthy. And so this is where we're going to uh, stop today. But I wanted to continue with this story later on. And we're going to talk about Abraham being promised a son and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. I hope that you've enjoyed this. I have. And I really um, thank you for tuning in today. And I hope that you have a lovely kitchen and that you have a glass of tea and that you can enjoy the rest of the day. My, my thoughts to you are Shalu, Shalom, Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem, always. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem because therein is our future. And knowing when Messiah returns, there will be peace in Jerusalem. Shalu, Shalom, Yerushalayim. Shalom, Shalom.